At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Martha Kirilidou. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm Martha Kirilidou, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second ARL Salary uh, webcast. We have four webcasts planned this year featuring the work that's related to the ARL Annual Salary Survey, and the first one is already on YouTube, and this one will also be available on YouTube. Uh, first, thank you uh, to all of you for joining us. As you've heard, everyone will be muted to cut down on background noise. We welcome questions. Please type your questions, and we stand ready to answer them. Questions and answers that we do not address, as well as the ones we address, will be distributed to attendees after the webcast along with the recording. So today here with us, uh, we have uh, three guests, uh, heads of ARL Research Libraries. We have Carla Stoffel, Dean of Libraries at the University of Arizona, Arnold Hershen, Associate Provost and University Librarian at Case Western Reserve University, and Jeffrey Treziak, University Librarian at Washington University in St. Louis. All of them have used the ARL Salary Survey in ways that go beyond the publication. And the goals we want to cover in today's webcast is exactly to discuss how to use the ARL Annual Salary Survey data beyond what is published uh, in the PDF uh, we, we make available uh, through the web and in print. Uh, we want to showcase how libraries have used the salary survey custom report services. Uh, libraries can uh, come to ARL and specify the parameters of uh, different data extractions they want uh, from the salary survey data. And we'll showcase how these three libraries have uh, proceeded in doing that. And we want to identify also how you can uh, demonstrate uh, issues with the salary structure at your institution that need to be addressed and think through some of the strategies leaders uh, and directors and deans of libraries use to make the case for improved salaries. So to accomplish these goals, we are going to move through the agenda by seeing how we can move beyond the publication. See, we're going to see how we can use the new um, information we collected for the first time last year on job titles to um, complement and enhance the job code uh, categories we use. Uh, we will look at the long-term strategy that the University of Arizona has implemented in using salary survey custom reports. We will look at an in-depth exploration of these data that Arnold Hershen did at Case Western University. And we look at the strategy from a new director's perspective as uh, Jeffrey Treziak assumes the directorship at the Washington University in St. Louis. And we hope to have time for questions, so please do um, use the box, the Q&A box, to fill in your questions. We will also have a few poll questions, and um, uh, you will see uh, my colleague, Amy Yeager, will be pushing the poll questions to you. And Amy, do you want to read this one? Uh, sure. I'll push the question out now, and you should see a box pop up in your screen. Um, the question reads, have you used the ARL salary survey to make the case for higher salaries at your institution? The answers are yes, no, or no, but we plan to use it. We'll give them a couple of seconds. Okay, I see answers are starting to come in. And the votes are for? Um, Stopping the question, okay. Uh, previewing the results, we have 54% said yes, 36% said no, and 9% said no, but they plan to use it. Okay, so the, you know, the majority have used it, but uh, a lot of them are planning to make more use. So you, you can use the, the publication, and what can you find in the publication? To How can you use the publication to make the case of for better salaries? 
uh, you can look at beginning professional salaries, and uh, we publish that information by institution. Uh, you can look at breakdowns um, for different job categories for men and women, for different minority groups. You can also look at the breakdowns for the different job categories using the job codes, the standardized job codes we use. Um, clearly, they, they are, you know, a little bit general, uh, but they do offer a perspective. We have the breakdowns with years of experience, with geographic region, regions. Uh, we have breakdowns of salaries by uh, different types of libraries, the privates, the publics, the Canadians, and of course um, by libraries groups in um, uh, different size based on their number of library staff they have into four different groupings. Uh, last year, for the first time, we collected job titles, and uh, a lot of that had to do with the revision of the job codes we used and validating whether the um, job, the new job codes uh, reflect new and emerging job titles adequately. But we have also found out that it's useful to use the job titles in, uh, uh, as we try to develop custom report services uh, for uh, salaries. And Arnold Hershen from Case Western actually had the opportunity to use um, some of that uh, job title information. Arnold, will you briefly share with us how was that useful to you? Sure. I'll talk in a, mo a little bit later about what we did in more in depth, but in this particular case, we had an associate director position come open, and before we advertised the position, I was asked even by the provost's office um, what the salary comp would be for the position because uh, we needed to be able to budget effectively for it. And so I checked with Martha and I said, if I gave you the following essentially key words, because every title is going to be slightly different from library to library, uh, can, you, can you give me salary uh, comparable information? And she gave me very useful information. It actually helped to show that, that we were currently bu under budgeting what we would likely need to budget to be able to fill the position. Thank you. And uh, this was the case uh, with a couple of other ARL libraries this year, so I'm, I'm really happy to already report that some of the new uh, ways of collecting data is having some direct uh, payoff. Uh, so before we move on to Carla Stoffel, the, who will describe the University of Arizona use of the salary data, we have another poll question for you, and Amy will read that to you. Uh, the second question asks whether your library has used salary comparative data to make a case for salary increases. Uh, you can choose once every year, uh, yes every year, yes once in a while, or no, not really. And people can cast their vote again. And the results okay. this time. Go ahead and stop the question. And previewing the results, 12% uh, use it every year, 62% once in a while, and 25% no, not really. Yeah, so the majority is once in a while. Uh, now, uh, Carla, is someone who has used the salary survey, not only the salary survey publication, but salary survey custom report on an annual basis, uh, and this started uh, before I came uh, here to ARL, so it's been happening for a number of years now, and she'll tell us um, the story of the University of Arizona's use of these data. Uh, Carla? Yes, thank you, Martha. Well, a little over 20 years ago when I came to the University of Arizona and I was negotiating my uh, package to be dean here, um, I noticed that the salaries for librarians were very low, and I asked the uh, then provost uh, if we could develop a plan for over three years to bring the salaries to uh, a higher level. And he suggested to me, I was coming from Michigan, so I was using Michigan salaries. He suggested to me that um, he had no evidence at all that our salaries were low, that he had 
uh, no idea that nobody showed him that anybody ever left because their salary was too low or that anybody ever turned us down because what we offered uh, was too low. And at this point in time, uh, the, the provost actually was bringing back to centrally all the money for positions and then you had to uh, justify a new position and at were faculty at assistant associate or full and then he used kind of uh, as his, his benchmark kind of what people were already making so it was basically the the poor getting poor so I uh, he challenged me to to prove to him that we needed to do something different and that I could come up with something that was uh, national in scope, national by meaning our university peers uh, across the country, that it would be regular and annual and that it would have legitimacy like the AAU salaries for assistant, associate, or full uh, faculty members uh, in universities. So I turned to ARL to see if something could be done with the salary survey to customize and compare our uh, salaries by rank with peer libraries. We had 15 uh, peer institutions identified by the Board of Regents. And uh, ARL staff looked at a number of possibilities and came up with 14 tables that compared Arizona's low, high, average, and median salaries to our 15 peers. And I, you'll see on the screen uh, uh, the, the, sal the, the, the categories that, uh, that we used uh, for salaries. To actually set our salaries, we, we started out first using years of experience, and then we moved to uh, rank as uh, the average salary by rank for our setting uh, most of our salaries. The rest of these, though, did give us useful data. For example, um, average salary by uh, uh, number of years of experience, for example, 10 to 14 years in rank order, sort of told us where, in general, our, our people were uh, outside of uh, assistant associate in full and um, helped us benchmark uh, the same with race, race and ethnicity. So we could do a number of comparisons uh, and uh, we, uh, we then moved to, um, and I, you see the five to nine years experience uh, by rank that gives you some, some of the data that we could actually uh, compare ourselves to. And then we sorted on average salary. So as I said, the first thing uh, we used was years of experience because within each of our ranks, uh, people were really compressed. Uh, everybody started at beginning and um, in Arizona, raises were sporadic, so there wasn't much differentiation uh, by years of experience. So we used years of experience to recruit new people, knowing that we were uh, creating compression, but we were also creating a market. And then within the um, existing people, we used years of experience to make um, uh, a case to the university that we needed to do something with uh, our longer term personnel. And um, we, we found using years of experience, the, the, one of the problems that we have is that year one and year two, the average salary um, may be high, but year three, it may actually be lower uh, than year one and two. And so we had to manipulate the years of experience and we did it in five-year uh, categories. So we would take five-year range and the, the low salary and the high salary and then average it out and then have a, uh, a number, consistent number. So when we averaged it out, it might be that there'd be a thousand dollar difference each year of experience. But after a time period when we, we sort of dealt with the first problem of 
uh, major compression, we realized that uh, within our what we were trying to do at the University of Arizona uh, reward uh, people by uh, uh, learning and uh, uh, that years of experience didn't necessarily mean that, that somebody was more uh, performing at a higher rate or more valuable to our program. So we, we had a new compensation program and we moved then to peer average by salary. Our first uh, set of peer averages, we have assistant associate in full, and this worked for, um, oh, 18 years. But uh, we found our peers uh, move to a four-step system. And so this last year, we've actually had to move to the four-step system for comparison because we only had one peer that was still using the three steps. So that, that became another uh, issue for us. Um, we take administrators out of uh, the ranks uh, and their salaries out when we actually figure the average salaries. And for comparison pur purposes, we also take it out of our, our peer salaries. Um, and we also uh, uh, try to uh, encourage uh, people to go up for promotion um, instead of uh, being long-term uh, in, uh, for example, the associate rank and, and being willing to stay at peer average. Um, now, as I said, uh, for some specialties, like IT and our development people and our HR, we couldn't stick to just the, uh, the rank salaries, assistant, associate, and full. Uh, in some cases, it was because people were not ranked in some of those jobs. In others, it became impossible to recruit librarians with uh, IT backgrounds at assistant librarian salaries. And so we had to move to uh, a different salary scale, and that's when we use the functional uh, table. Um, we found also that uh, after uh, a few years that people, especially from the East Coast and major urban centers, often make more uh, than an assistant librarian salary where they would be ranked because they haven't been in a faculty ranking system. Um, that those assistant salaries have been low and that there really hasn't been much that we've in fact done to tackle that yet. So people have actually had to accept lower salaries or um, not accept the job. And um, we've had to create uh, administrative salaries because our categories don't match ARL. So our team leaders are more than department heads but they're less than assistant directors. So I, I have had to create for team leaders um, a salary structure that uh, sort of averages assistant director and the average for department heads and create a new level for ourselves. But our benefits have been that uh, our salaries are, are really competitive now except in a few subject uh, specialists. Uh, instances. Uh, our assistant librarians all make at least 56,000. Our associate librarians make 70, and our full librarians make at least 85,000. Um, another benefit is for us, the peer salaries generally go up uh, each year, and the increments are, are actually fairly consistent over uh, 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 the years. And the campus accepts our benchmarks, and we have actually, the first uh, 10 years, we're actually able to get campus money uh, to bring um, our salaries up. And uh, recently, we've, we've still asked 10 years, we've been able to use these benchmarks to uh, add actually market money to our salaries. And these have all been approved because we had this data. So uh, we also continually check the data on the other dimensions to be sure that uh, we haven't created a problem that we were not aware of. Some of our issues are that uh, 
market issues are sometimes caused by using just ranks, and I mentioned those, IT or uh, people from other areas, that we create compression with this system and we deliberately do it. So that in years when there's there's no raise money, some folks uh, get discouraged because the peer average is going up and they're not going up, and um, and, and uh, so they they get a little uh, cranky with the system, um, and that without constantly sort of explaining this system, individuals who come to work with us don't necessarily understand what we're doing and why in the system. And so we have to continually remember that we need to explain what we're, we're doing with this system. Also, promotions. When you promote from assistant to associate, for example, this year, we'll have several people who will get raises of fourteen or $15,000 in their promotion. Uh, that's good for them, uh, but it's sometimes difficult for the library to come up with the money, but, but we do do this uh, consistently with promotions. Uh, once in a while, the averages drop, um, especially the last few years, the averages have dropped in the full librarian ranks. Uh, and we believe it's probably because this is where people are mostly retiring. So there are some associate librarians who are looking and seeing that three years ago, if they promoted, they would have gotten a much larger raise than if they promote now or next year. And that um, doesn't encourage uh, some of the things that, uh, that we would like to encourage. But it's worked uh, pretty well up to now for um, our salaries uh, for librarians at Arizona. Thank you, Carla. There is a question from uh, Eileen Theodore Schuster at Ohio University. She's asking whether you considered using median rather than average figures. Why using average? Uh, we're using average. I think we chose um, the average salary at the time. The average salary was higher than medium, uh, median, and my, uh, my purpose was to get salaries up. So that's why I chose average. Great. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we move on with our second speaker, speaker Arnold. Okay, good good afternoon or whatever time you're in. Um, I'm going to uh, explain that our approach was um, this was the first time a market equity study had been done in the library probably in quite some time. And our salary equity review was really an integral part of our strategic planning process. It was not an independent exercise. It came towards the end of the strategic planning process after we had done the strategic plan, after we had redesigned our organization um, so that we knew what all the positions would be in the new organization. We had all the job descriptions in that new organization. And so this this set the context for now that we know what the jobs are, how do we appropriately pay people for the jobs that they're about to be doing, or in some cases, by the time the salary re review was completed, the jobs they were actually already doing. So if we can uh, skip a couple of slides, please. Um, the, so when we did the market equity study, we did it uh, looking at four different categories of staff. We had exempt staff who were in the library broadband family, which I'll explain in a moment. We had exempt staff who were outside of the library broadband. We had non-exempt staff both in a library broadband for non-exempt and a non-exempt university classification. So the family, the library job family was all positions um, that were unique to the library. And so if you look at the exempt and the non-exempt, it would have been um, exempt and non-exempt. If we look just the exempt, it's librarians and non-librarians, but positions for which there's no comparable position elsewhere in the university. And um, the university terminology here for this was broadband, which is really an HR classification system. But the easiest way of thinking about it for most academic librarians is our librarian broadband was equivalent to academic status. 
and it was a four-tier, and it is a four-tier system, as Carla was explaining, uh, ours are librarian one, two, three, and four. One of the things that we did when we made this switch, um, at, originally when we were talking to HR, about, university HR, about making these changes, they wanted to move uh, everybody to apply for every job, and we did not want to do that. And so we created generic job descriptions, and the four classifications have these generic job descriptions for anybody who's in the broadband. And the, the four categories will be familiar to probably anybody who's in an academic or faculty status situation, things that relate to job performance, professional contributions, service publications and presentations, and so forth, professional knowledge, abilities, and skills, and professional qualities. And people have to be able to show competence in all four of those areas. The other thing that we stressed um, to the exempt staff who are in the library broadband is that as you move up the ladder from a librarian one to a librarian two to a three and a four, your, the expectations for what it takes to move to the next level, stay at the next level, and go on to the level beyond that, the expectations continue to increase. That was also something that was probably um, a little bit new for people to uh, get their heads around, but, but it also affected how we did salary uh, study and how we approach the process. So I mentioned that we replaced the individual job-specific position descriptions with one generic library position description. So there's one description for librarian ones, another description for librarian twos, and so forth. Um, and then there may be supplemented with a small number of either specialist or officer descriptions, um, and we had separate uh, descriptions that were required for team leaders or for associate directors, our team leaders or what others might have at the uh, department head level equivalent. But basically all of these fold into one big g generic job description. So even a team leader, for example, may have that team leader uh, job description, but um, that job description supplements does not replace the generic job description. So we also had um, on t another layer of this is for certain categories of staff, we had, for example, for our research services librarians, what we call a balanced portfolio. All of them have areas of responsibility related to collection management, to instruction, to research support, and relationship management with faculty and students. And these are the four minimum sets of responsibilities, but they can, some people might have a higher concentration during the course of the year, they may be doing more instruction but less collection management or more collection management but less research support. The point is they should balance this across the year and they should be talking with their team leader about that. All of this folds then into the salary equity process because we were having to then figure out how are we going to have comparables in a situation like this. Now. Again, I'm only talking about one of the four groups that we looked at, which is the library, librarian and library job family broadband. So we asked ARL to comp compile salary data for four cohorts. One was for Case Western defined institutional peers, and those are the ins institutions as defined by the university, not defined by the library. We asked them to also, we asked ARL to also collect information for six other private universities around the country. We asked them to combine those two data sets into a single data set. And then we asked for a fourth one of just the four other ARLs that are in Ohio, just in case that issue were to come up within the university, which I'll explain later why it didn't. But um, we had all that data if we needed that data. Now, when ARL sends you the data, and this is uh, an opportunity that Martha and I have been talking about, is it comes in very raw form. And so the first thing that we needed to do was take a whole lot of data dumping that came in four different um, spreadsheet tabs with um, hundreds of rows on each one and collapse it so that it was readable. Now, this gives you um, the number of data elements that we had 
and it was low, low, high, average, and median were the numbers that we received in uh, all cases except for a few. Um, in some cases, if there are not enough um, institutions in a cohort, ARL requires that there have to be at least a minimum of at least four um, people or positions uh, that are comparable. Uh, so if there were fewer than four, we would only get average and median, but we wouldn't necessarily get um, low and, and high. This is the first part of the data elements. This, this is the second part of the data elements. We got all of this data from ARL, and if you started doing the statistical combinations of this, you can obviously see that they number in the millions. So how do we take that data and make it usable and manageable? So. Uh, if you think back to that slide a few, a few slides ago of the raw data, we took that raw data and what you see on the next slide, you can advance the next slide please, um, what you'll see in this slide is just one of the many tables. Um, so this gives you our peers, that's the institutional peers, middle management, in rank order, sorted by average, um, and it gives the average and the median. And going back to the question that Carla was answering before, uh, let me just make a generalization. We looked, before we decided to use one versus the other, we looked at average and median across the board of the various categories we chose to use. And frankly, there was little to no statistically significant difference between them in our peer cohorts. And you kind of get a sense of that as you look through this one right now. So it really, if you use the average, it was 76,000. If you use uh, 197, use the median, it was 75, 897. It, it was almost random which one we picked. So we looked at a number of possible approaches um, for organizing and selecting our data, and we found that there was just so much data, and there were a number of things that we tried that didn't work tried to use a multivariate analysis and inclusion of too many variables, increased complexity and did absolutely nothing for increasing the value of the data that was being generated, so we started eliminating variables. Um, we looked at trying to set the salary by specific functions or by specific positions. By and large, we found that the data did not support it and some of it was almost random. Um, if we have a combined acquisitions, cataloging operation, and ARL separates acquisitions and cataloging data, does it really do as much good to use two separate sets of data? So it, it also became just too complicated to do it by that, that method. Uh, we tried adjusting, we looked at, at adjusting salary for cost of living for our geographic location, and we purposely chose not to. This was almost something that we were predicting human resources would ask us for. Ultimately, they did not. And we, our argument was we did not want to adjust for cost of living for four reasons. One, our recruitment is national, not regional, as Carla explained. Um, the comparisons must factor in actual residents of employees in a suburban area. We're in a city. Um, we have lots of suburban areas. And I pulled up cost of living data for two towns that were right next to each other and got wildly different cost of living data. I said, when am I going to go through this and pick the town for every single employee? So that didn't work. Most peers had higher salaries but lower costs of living than we did. Um, so the data didn't really provide as much there. And we also were concerned that the ARL index score, which is in part based upon simply how much you spend, our, if we used a lower salary as a basis based on cost of living, we were simply going to lower our ARL index score. Uh, we didn't want to do that. And finally, we looked at calculating years of experience year by year, and we went to the same clustering that Carla talked about because you cannot use, when you've got data that goes from year one to year 40, year by year, there are just too many statistical anomalies there. And so we clustered um, in five-year increments, which were the same as Carla. And we did that without knowing that Carla had done that years ago, and so I guess it worked for both of us. So um, some things um, that did work. One, we created a normalized peer cohort. We did not take any one set of ARL data 
or one statistical der derivation. We took instead, and then you'll see it when I get to uh, a little bit farther down in the next slide, you'll see that we created a new salary table that interpolated data and said in some cases it might have been median, in some cases it might have been um, high-low, but we, we did it on an interpolation basis. We created a new base salary table. Then within each of the four broadband categories, we ranked base salary by years of experience clusters, which I'll get to in a moment. And then for individuals uh, with managerial administrative assignments, those team leaders, we added a stipend. So this is what it looked like. Go to the next slide. Um, the salary table, if you um, use, if you look to the uh, left, those were um, what, what we see are the minimum, the medians, and the maximums. Um, that's what we used to calculate our new base salaries. And the dot plus signs that you see on the right side, that's how much we had to add to our current salary chart to, to make the difference. So you can see, for example, at Librarian 2, um, the maximum had to go up by $12,000, but and Librarian 4 it only had to go up by $4,000. Then we adjusted by years of experience. And if we go to the next slide, it'll be a little bit easier to explain that. Um, the we basically said you, we're expecting that at certain levels, you already had a certain number of years of experience. So there was no sense in making an adjustment for a librarian for with three years of ex only three years of library experience, because we wouldn't have a librarian for with that few years of experience. We also wanted to max it out because at some point, having uh, 20 years, 25 years, 35 years, 40 years at the same rank is not necessarily giving us qualitatively anything higher. And so you can see uh, in the orange where the stepping goes in, but it's not a formal step system. The reason I say it's not a formal step system is we use this to calculate a one-time adjustment to rebalance the salaries, but this is not something that we would keep adding year after year after year. It was once we got somebody to the right salary level, it would that would be the level that the person would keep tracking with thereafter. We go to the next slide. Um, our team's uh, leader stipends uh, were not are not calculated into the individual's base salary. So if we had a librarian three and the librarian three were being paid. $60,000, on top of that, we would add this stipend. This was something new for us. We had not done this before. We do compute it as an increase to compensation. In other words, um, that stipend amount is calculated on, on salary plus fringe benefits, but it is not in the base salary. We used a standardized dollar amount for all affected team leaders. We did not do it on the basis of the individual's base salary. So every team leader just gets a standard um, stipend, and this only affects team leaders. Um, there's a different stipend system for associate directors. And it's paid annually on a fund per permitting basis, and we started it in the current fiscal year. And we reserve the right to adjust the stipend amounts annually, upward or downward. Now. Would we likely decrease it? No, we wouldn't, but we did not want to set an expectation that we might not have been able to meet, and so we just want to make sure that people understood that from the beginning. Uh, Arnold, um, yeah. is the stipend sort of a bonus in some ways, or what's the difference? How no, it's not, a, it's not a bonus. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, first of all, it's, it's paid, uh, it's, it's divided up, we pay um, uh, monthly, so it's, it's cut up into 12 payments um, during the year, which a bonus typically would be paid once. Um, and it is not performance-based. It is for responsibility basis. Thank you. Um, so uh, just to finish up quickly, some other findings. Um, for individuals who we found who were currently above market and who therefore were overcompensated, we did not make any salary reductions. That was a university HR requirement. Uh, we found that most of our most significant salary discrepancies were for the team leaders, primarily because of the stipends, but also in part because of their base salaries. We found that, by and large, the lower two ranks of librarian one or two required greater salary remediation than the higher two ranks. 
and that we made no base salary increases, um, except unless somebody was uh, not at the new minimum. We made no base salary changes in fiscal 2013, and we said that if we do make them, uh, they'll occur no earlier than uh, this coming July, um, and that would be done only if funding permits. Um, and if funding permitted us to make only some adjustments but not others, we would have priorities and announce what the implementation schedule would be for that to all staff. So then the question comes, okay, so where is there money to close these gaps? Those stipends that I mentioned, we funded from existing library funds. Uh, we are not going to, we're a private university, we have significant endowments, but we are not funding any salary uh, changes out of endowment because um, salary uh, endowment income can fluctuate significantly um, over the course of a few years. Even though we're on a rolling average, it can fluctuate, and so we did not want to do this unless we had predictable income. Um, we have always told the staff that um, the we, that the purpose of the salary equity study was to establish the extent of the problem, not necessarily that we would have sufficient funds to rec rectify it immediately, but it would be a priority to try and rectify it over a few years. Um, thus far, we've uh, had to fund all of the changes from the existing library budget. Um, by making the stipend changes, we probably closed the total gap by about 30%. I'm hopeful that we can close about another 10 to 20 percent of the original gap um, in fiscal 2014, and we're still requesting additional funds from the university to try and close the remaining gaps, but that's all going to depend upon the budget, and it's probably too early to say whether or not that's going to be possible. So thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, uh, Brian Keith from the University of Florida is asking uh, whether it's the same stipend for each team leader. Yes, it is. Every team leader gets exactly the same stipend amount. It's a fixed amount. And he has a second part in his question. Are all of the team leaders' admin responsibilities the same? I would say by and large, yes. Um, in terms of complexity of responsibility, in terms of uh, they, they may have somewhat different numbers of staff that they're supervising or the level of staff that they are supervising, but by and large our, our belief is that we balance out what the expectations are. And so we might have one team leader who may be supervising more people, but the more people that the person may be supervising may be at non-exempt level, where somebody who's supervising fewer people may have more exempt staff. So on the whole, yes, we, we thought that this was a fair balance so that we were not getting into why is one getting paid more or less of a stipend than the other. Yeah, this is very helpful. Thank you very much. And just to remind uh, that uh, Brian Keith actually is going to be the speaker in the third webcast, the next webcast in the series, and he's going to talk also about the market equity approach at the University uh, of Florida. Uh, but in the meantime, and before, thank you, Arnold, um, uh, we're going to move into our next speaker, but we do have a poll in the meantime. Um, Amy? Uh, the third question reads, uh, our salary increases or adjustments are basically happening through flat percent increases, flat dollar amount increases, merit increases, variable, variable adjustment methods, or no increases in recent history. We'll wait a couple of minutes for some responses to come in. And we want to get a little bit of the pulse of the audience on how, um, what their experience is in their organizations um, these days. Okay, I'll stop the question now. And previewing the results with just seven answers so far, we have 28% uh, set of flat percent, in, flat percent increases. Uh, no one had flat dollar amount, 42% merit increases, 28% uh, variable adjustment methods, and 0% had no increases in recent history. That's 0% is encouraging. Uh, thank you, Amy. And uh, uh, Jeffrey Treziak from the uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Jeffrey? Thank you, Martha. 
Um, my presentation is probably going to be um, uh, fairly brief uh, since I am new to the role of university librarian at Washington University in St. Louis, and we're still uh, really in the early stages of working with the data that we've received from uh, ARL and working with our institution to address uh, some of the issues that we have with, with salaries. Um, just for uh, a bit of uh, information uh, about the university and how this data uh, pertains to it, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm focusing on the library locations uh, that report to me as the university librarian. Uh, so that does not include our law library, our medical library, or the social work library. Uh, the university, in fact, has not uh, conducted any kind of internal review of all the libraries during uh, this process, that the discussions have all been around uh, the librarians who are part of the university library uh, organization. And the request uh, that I uh, put forward for increases uh, uh, pertained only, uh, again, to the university librarians that are part of our, our organization. Uh, when I started in July of 2012, uh, there were a significant number of vacancies uh, at uh, a number of levels, uh, including uh, there were about nine, uh, it included uh, two associate university librarians, or soon two university libra associate university librarians, uh, but there were many that were in uh, high priority areas, uh, e-resource management, uh, copyright, digital library services, digital archivist, et, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I quickly discovered that uh, the individuals were leaving uh, the organization uh, because they were finding comparable positions at other institutions uh, where they were being drawn away by higher salaries. And we obtained this information from them through, uh, largely through exit interviews. So we had some data when I started to show uh, that WashU was not being uh, competitive in terms of the salaries that we were uh, offering our professionals. Uh, unfortunately, the challenge that we, we have had is that relative to our peers, uh, WashU is underfunded, uh, and that affects not only our ability to recruit and retain uh, staff at all levels, but it really affects all of the operations. So at the same time that we had this issue with the salary, we also had very little uh, leeway in terms of um, salary uh, in order to fund any kind of increases. Around the same time, I actually learned about the issue with our salaries here at WashU from Arnold, uh, who had already started this process and called uh, to alert me to the fact uh, that WashU was quite low uh, in terms of salaries at all levels that we were offering. Uh, I knew that we were uh, low, uh, but until I had an opportunity to talk to Arnold and really do an initial review of the ARL stats, I didn't realize that at that point how low we, we really were relative to our peers. And while examining this data initially, we were also in the process of conducting some searches uh, to fill the existing vacancies that we had. And through that process, we had uh, three of our most qualified candidates uh, turn us down uh, due to low salaries, which gave us some additional data. And we were, at that point, we were really not able to adjust the salaries uh, in order to meet the needs of the, uh, the candidates uh, because the ranges were completely out of whack. So we knew we had to adjust um, salaries at all levels uh, in order uh, to address the issue. Uh, we made the request from ARL uh, for data uh, from uh, WashU and our peers. Uh, so that included institutions like Chicago, uh, Case Western, Rochester, Vanderbilt, Duke, uh, and others. And we requested uh, data for all levels of our professional staff, uh, although when we went to make the request for the adjustments, we really focused on uh, the lower levels, which I'll explain in a minute. The uh, budget process at WashU is, our budget year is July through June, uh, and unfortunately, while we were working with the university on this salary issue, uh, in preparing our budget for next year, the university asked all uh, units to submit a possible 5% budget reduction. The, uh, in February then of this year, uh, when uh, our budget requests were going in, uh, we submitted, uh, in addition to the possible 5% budget cuts, we also requested an additional $150,000 uh, to enhance librarian salaries, having already received the initial data from uh, ARL. And we were able to provide this data uh, to the university along with the, um, along with the request that went in with our budget submission. 
at that point, the request was then forwarded to our central HR for review. Uh, they used the ARL data that uh, we requested, but they also conducted uh, their own market analysis uh, using data from Towers Watson and also from uh, the College University Personnel Association. Uh, so they accepted the data from ARL, but also wanted to get uh, some additional uh, data from uh, outside, uh, uh, and they were able to get this through Towers Watson and, and Kufa. We then worked with uh, HR to identify how we would distribute uh, the, the funding. Uh, at this point, uh, HR factored in uh, that we were going to get uh, an across-the-board 2.5% uh, increase anyway. Uh, so they, they re reduced uh, the amount that we were requesting, but the total add-on request was actually uh, increased uh, as a result to $158,000. At this point, we chose to limit it to the librarians that were at the lowest ranks because we believe that's where we had uh, the greatest problems with salaries. So essentially it's everyone under middle management. And we identified three ways of distributing uh, the funding, which would be based on qualifications, skills, excuse me, four areas, performance and, and comp ratio. Uh, in priority order then, we identified uh, skills would be first. Uh, this included things like language proficiency uh, and technical skills. Second would be qualifications, uh, largely identifying uh, dual degrees uh, or additional advanced degrees like a PhD. Uh, performance, uh, which had always been part of the annual uh, process, so we didn't want to exclude it from this. And then also where they were uh, in their comp ratio uh, in terms of their years of service uh, and uh, salary increases. The process then uh, continued with the request uh, once it was reviewed by our central HR, it was then forwarded to the provost office for approval. So at this point, HR was just saying, the data is accurate, we understand uh, the request, uh, uh, let's send it off to the provost office for approval. And the provost office approved the process, uh, but not necessarily the ask for additional funding. Uh, it was then forwarded on uh, to the personnel review committee, who also approved the process that we went through. We won't know uh, until really June, uh, roughly a month or so, uh, whether or not we're going to get approval for this. Uh, uh, given the fact that we've been asked for a 5% reduction, I'm not entirely confident uh, and suspect that uh, there could be an acknowledgement of a problem, uh, but the suggestion that we deal with the problem internally, uh, reallocating funds is necessary, not necessarily re receiving additional funds uh, in order to increase salaries. But I won't know in, until really June uh, how the university is going to handle it. And that, at that point, that's really roughly where we are. It's still very early stages for us. Uh, I'm hopeful for a positive outcome, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure what will result. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, it's, it's clearly, you know, this, um, there's blessings in having all these data and information, but at the same time, you know, sometimes you cannot take action right away. And um, you all mentioned that if um, you would, um, elaborate a little bit, uh, Jeffrey, on the aspect of communication and what are some key elements in, in that communication process because this, as we've seen, is an iterative process that has many steps. Uh, in terms of communicating with the uh, university administration? Yes, that would be one aspect, communication also with some of the candidates, as you said, that, you know, uh, went for other jobs. All, all the all, um, a number of different communication aspects. If is there some specific elements you would like to highlight as to uh, what uh, have worked positively, what has worked positively in some of these? Um, the the exit aspects. interview with departing uh, librarians was instrumental in identifying, identifying the fact uh, that we were losing people to other institutions who were paying more. Uh, so that was uh, a very important part of the process. Um, we were also, uh, of course, in, in the interview process, uh, speaking to candidates uh, who we were offering positions to who were declining based on salary, and we were able to identify then with them 
what their salary expectations were and in some cases what other institutions uh, they were being recruited by. So we were able to make comparisons there. And this was all really useful data uh, for us to have. Uh, Washington University, of course, plays, pays very close attention to what peers are doing, uh, and we were able to make the point that in order to be competitive, uh, we really needed to take a harder look at our salaries, and having that data certainly helped. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Arnold and Carla, uh, anything you would like to highlight on the communication aspect? Uh, well, uh, you, you know, at you really need to uh, not only communicate with the administration and then central HR, which we try to do regularly so that they understand what we're doing, but it's imperative that you continue to be sure that the, the library faculty understand what you're doing and what your, your parameters are. Um, you know, we went five years basically with, without raises, which really plays havoc then with any kind of compensation system. And we, we've suffered, I think, a number of uh, problems and assumed that people understood that the university just wasn't giving us any money. And um, I think that we, we should have talked um, more specifically about what was happening and uh, what our plans would eventually be. Um, also, we went four or five years where uh, uh, we didn't sell fund raises, and in the past uh, we had self-funded to keep this system going. And so uh, I think stepping away from that, uh, even though it would have it would have meant again. It, deeper budget cuts was probably a problem. So it's, you need to communicate with a lot of people and have them continually understand why the salaries are the way they are and that it's not haphazard. Yeah, and the strategy, you know, may, there are certain elements of a strategy that are appropriate for different points in time. Right. Um, right. One more question for all the, the speakers, and Arnold, feel free when your turn comes to mention anything related to communication, but this is a very interesting um, question coming from Kim uh, Berhope uh, at Duke University. Uh, she would like to hear the speaker's thoughts on basing salary on years of experience versus skill sets or performance. Uh, that's a great question, and I think what we tried to do was achieve a compromise on that point, recognizing that to a certain extent, the more experience that somebody has, it complements and increases their skill set. But I have for many, many years said there's a difference between having 10 years of experience and one year of experience 10 times. And that's really when you get down to the salary issues, what it comes down to. And it, it raises the whole problem of when you do a study like this, what you're trying to do is implement a system that can work for tens or hundreds of people, and it may flatten out some of the individual um, contributions and the individual benefits that somebody brings to the job. But what you're doing is, is basically trying to recognize a certain amount of experience, recognize a certain amount of years that it takes to get that experience, but not necessarily try and um, do that exclusively. Very good. This is Carla. We, uh, we used years of experience initially to try to get some distance uh, uh, among our folks by uh, within the ranks. Uh, we don't use it at all uh, anymore. And uh, I, I guess the issue is one that, that, that uh, Arnold uh, raises is it's very hard to tell uh, by years of experience uh, whether it's ten different years or one year ten times. And so we move to a philosophy that says if we bring people in at midpoint, which is the average, 
then we will try to keep them at midpoint, assuming that um, they are performing um, their job very well uh, and that they should be compensated at that point, and that beyond that, merit should be the determiner. Uh, and part of that merit is gaining new skills and making broader contributions to the organization. Thank you. Jeffrey, would you like to comment on this last point? If not, we can move on. Um, we're going to uh, remind everybody that we have our next webcast on September 10th. It's a case study of using the ARL salary data to establish and maintain an equitable salary structure for faculty librarians. And as I mentioned before, um, it's uh, going to focus on some of the techniques uh, developed at the University of Florida, uh, which is actually the place where they are also developing the uh, position data bank and uh, um, uh, my colleague uh, here at ARL uh, that will join us for that webcast will uh, talk about that aspect. I would, on November 5th, we have another webcast on analyzing age and race ethnicity uh, demographics with uh, Mark Puente and, um, um, and our, our demographer, Stanley Wilder. Um, and um, we look forward to seeing many of you there. I would like to thank our speakers, today's speakers, Carla Stoffel, Arnold Hirschen, and Jeffrey Treziak. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of you for being with us. Till next time. <laughs>